up next on KZSU Stanford, another episode of Modern Education with your host, Ben Woodford. This episode is a pre-recorded live episode. Stay tuned for more Modern Education. education we're right here in the kzsu studio under memorial auditorium and we bring you a live or sometimes pre-recorded show here from the studio each week we sit down and talk with educators and researchers and people from different backgrounds trying to get at what modern education is today uh, i'm really excited for my guest really excited to bring my guest on today, Michael Tomasello, and I also am excited for my guest co-host today, Diego Sierra. Uh, Diego is going to be helping with the interview today. He is a graduate from the Stanford uh, Master's Program in Learning Design and Technology, and Michael Tomasello is our guest today. Michael Tomasello was born in January 18th, 1950. He's an American developmental and comparative psychologist, as well as a linguist. He's co-director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, co-director of the Wolfgang Kohler Primate Research Center, honorary professor at University of Leipzig and at Manchester University's Department of Psychology. He's also a professor of psychology at Duke University. His current interests are processes of social cognition, social learning, cooperation, and communication from developmental, comparative, and cultural perspectives. Michael is the author of the new, uh, his new book, which is called um, Becoming Human. A hum- a, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little crossed up here. Uh, What's the name of your book, Michael? Help me out here. Becoming Human, A Theory of Ontogeny. Exactly. Thank you. I got a little tongue twisted. Thanks again. Um, so we'll bring everybody on the mic and we'll just get started with the conversation. Thank you both for joining me. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you, Ben, for having us. And thank Hello. you, Michael, for making up the time. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, I, there, I, feel, I find the title, <laughs> Becoming Human, A Theory of Ontogeny. So this book is amazing. I mean, I think I need to read it a few more times before I can say I've got it all yet. But in general, um, your your look ontogeny is is looking at development of like the history of an organism within its lifetime. Now, what does a reader of this book hope to gain, or what what are some of the the things that you hope people will get out of reading your new book? On the kind of um, large scale. Well, yeah, okay. I used the word ontogeny in the title on purpose. I know it's not an everyday word, and we normally talk about development, uh, child development or something like that. Uh, but uh, ontogeny is the word that biologists use. And, it's, uh, and so this book takes an evolutionary perspective on human development, um, which means that we also kind of probe back into human evolution and try to say, how are we adapted to be the way that we are? And then see how that plays out in the individual lifetime. Um, and uh, the general proposal is that human beings are not any more clever or you know, any smarter or anything else than other creatures on their own. But what they're adapted to do is to put their heads together with others, to participate in um, collaborative groups, uh, to communicate, to learn from others, to teach others, um, and, uh, and, and, and so that if you had a child, here's, here's the hypothesis, if you had a child raised on a desert island with no social interaction whatsoever, as an adult, that child would be something like an ape. <laughs> Maybe a little bit different, but not much. Okay. What makes them, re- what makes them really different is that that child is collaborating, communicating, and learning from others for its whole lifetime. And, and so they're adapted for that. And if that's, it'd be like if you were born, you know, in total darkness, your eye would wither away. So our biological adaptations for, you know, cultural learning and social interaction uh, wouldn't do anything on the desert island. They would have no material to work with. So wow. it's, a, it's, a, it's a theory about 
uh, how we are biologically adapted, um, but those biological adaptations need social interaction and cultural interactions um, to come to fruition. Wow. Okay. So that ties in, I think, to what you what you reference in your book about a neo Vygotskyan theory. So Vygotsky's theory was. Uh, just for our listeners, was basically this socio-cultural approach to learning where we learn through the social and cultural interactions, and those are deeply embedded, if not absolutely necessary, for human learning. So your, yeah. your, your theory is, is attempting to kind of bridge this idea of socio-cultural learning with the, the developmental and evolutionary perspectives that go along with that, or to make them go along with that? Is, yeah. that, is that correct? My, uh, my dog, my dog participates in lots of sociocultural interactions, but my dog doesn't learn language. My dog doesn't turn into a human. So what, what uh, the, the evolutionary approach says we are adapted for uh, learning in this way and for interacting with others in this way. And that's the neo Vygotsky part. Vygotsky just talked about the important role of sociocultural interactions, uh, and I second that, I agree with that, but I'm trying to say where does our uh, propensity for doing this and our ability to profit from this come from? And it comes from an evolutionary history whereby humans had to collaborate with others and cooperate with others in order to survive, um, and those individuals who weren't able to do that died out. So we have a genetic predisposition for this, but again, it has to play itself out in ontogeny. Um, and so the neo Vygotskyan is adding an evolutionary dimension to this um, sociocultural theory. Wow. This is fascinating, Michael. And uh, I think that from everyone hearing who probably has something to do with education, either being a teacher, a researcher, or a practitioner, um, they will be really looking forward to hear about this neo Vygotskyan theory because it might uh, actually bridge some of the abstract and theories. And uh, actually here, Ben, is a huge fan of your theory of perspectives and joint attention. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I find this this whole approach that you, you take is, is deeply connected to the idea of perspective. And you, you mention it in many, many different contexts throughout the book. Do you have a, a defini- yeah. like a working definition and an operi- operationalization of what a perspective is in this context? The way, the way you really use it? Question. That's a really good question, and it's, um, it's something that I think is a sort of a, a novelty uh, of my approach that other people haven't really focused on. So uh, if you just look out one side of the building and I look out the other side of the building, I don't think it's really appropriate to say we have different perspectives. You just see one thing and I just see another. So, I think so a we have a difference in a field of view in that example, right? Yeah, exactly. Just a difference in a field of view. But if you and I are sharing attention to something, then you can say, you see it this way, I see it that way. You see it from this perspective, I see it from that perspective. So perspective presumes a common focus of attention on which uh, we have different perspectives. And so that's why my, my, my theory um, uh, rests on this notion of sharedness, shared intentionality. Uh, I, I borrowed that term from the philosophers. Mm-hmm. where we know that we're sharing attention to something, and at the same time, we know we have different perspectives. So it's simultaneously sharedness and individuality, a shared focus of attention and individual perspectives, and that comes as a package. Wow. Now, if, if we kind of take that a little further, have you thought about or conceptualized ways to measure this or even look at it in a sort of reproducible way? Um, the way we've looked at it mostly is... Um, what people have talked about, linguists have talked about, is common ground. So if I use the word, if I say to you, um, that was great, uh, given our context, you have no idea what I'm talking about. The word that is used when I presume we have common ground. So if you and I had talked about watching a ball game last night, and then this morning I said, that was great, you would know what I was talking about. So what we have done with children is we have actually manipulated the common ground that say that we have shared a playing with this certain kind of toy, and then we use the word it or some other kind of measurement, and they know what we're talking about. So it's, it's a, we had a joint focus of attention on this toy, 
and therefore it, it enters into our common ground. If you and I, you know, uh, share an interest in whatever, fishing, <laughs> then we have common ground about fishing that we don't have with other people, and we can talk about it in a different way. But what we measured in children is that um, the, the effects of joint attention in producing common ground and the way that affects their communication. And amazingly enough, we have people that are so surprised at this, but very, very young children, even 18-month-old toddlers, still in diapers and still, uh, some of them not even walking that well, already are knowing what common ground they share with some people and that they don't share uh, with other people. Um, so that's, the, that, that's the, um, the way we've actually looked at it experimentally. And you can also just observe it, observe joint attention and perspective in, uh, in everyday interaction with adults and children as they play with toys together and they, they typically will look back and forth from the eyes to the toy they're sharing attention to and things. Um, in, in those natural observations, it's hard to get to measure a notion of perspective, but um, uh, you can see it uh, happening, but then when we do the experiments with common ground, we actually see the effect of, uh, of uh, having had joint attention on something. It seems like a sort of natural con uh, consequence of this is that people have a really hard time communicating without this common ground as a starting point. Is that fair? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, let, me, let me answer that two ways. One is um, um, all the time, we probably uh, a, a, a several dozen times an hour, if you're talking to people, you will use the word it or that or he or she, and you have to have common ground to know what those mean. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, we have these kind of sequences all the time, which I will say something like, uh, do you want to go to the movie tonight? And you'll say, I have a test in the morning. Well, does that mean yes or no? <laughs> we, all, we, all, we all assume it means no, and that's because we have common ground that a test in the morning means studying tonight, and studying tonight means you can't go to a movie. We, our communication is grounded in that kind of common ground, and without it, our linguistic interactions wouldn't, um, uh, wouldn't uh, register uh, in most cases. Uh, and the second thing I'll say is um, I've studied a lot with young children the pointing gesture. And now pointing depends totally on common ground. It, imagine that I'm there in the studio with you and I just point over in the direct to the left or something. You look over there, but you have no idea why do I want you to look over there. But if we, you know, if you're saying, gosh, where did I leave my phone? And I point over there and you see your phone, uh, then the fact that we both know you're looking for your phone, that's our common ground, uh, makes the pointing gesture uh, automatically meaningful. And the pointing is an interesting example because um, unlike language, there's no content. There's no symbols uh, uh, that have meaning in them. It's just uh, I'm sticking my finger out. How, how does that mean there's your phone? Well, it means there's your phone because of the common ground we have that you're looking for your phone and I'm directing your attention over in a certain direction and you're assuming that I want to communicate something. All that's common ground. And so what children are doing early in development is building up common ground, general common ground with others, and particular common ground with particular others, and their communication depends on it, uh, and language acquisition depends on it totally. So this, this to me relates, uh, you mentioned in the book that people around age three begin to have an objective perspective, which is presumably yeah. a, 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 an approach to making truth sort of exist outside of yourself so you can internalize the culture of the social setting you're in? Yeah. Now, um, I'm, I'm curious if this, this objectifying or uh, making objective truths that seem to exist outside of our personal choices is almost a mechanism for creating language common ground or even just, you know, social common ground and maybe also the reason why we may have it be so hard to have common ground with somebody. Yeah, that's great. I, I, I think that the kind of common ground I was talking about, that we both know you're looking for your phone, mm -hmm. I, I don't think you need a real objectified version there, but you do uh, later. So you and I have a lot of cultural common ground um, that we don't, we don't know uh, directly. So 
Um, we both know who the president of the United States is, even though we've never met before, never talked before. But I'm, I'm assuming you know that, and, and, uh, and yeah, you're assuming I, I know that. I know it. I'm not necessarily happy about it, but that's life, right? <laughs> that's another. That's another conversation. <laughs> right. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, keep going. Sorry. But so what happens is after three years of age. Uh, children know that there's some things that are in the common ground of everyone, even though they have never um, met that person before. So, for example, we did a study where uh, we came in, a, a new adult came in the room. This is a three-year-old and a four-year-old child, and they never met this adult before. And sitting over on the table was a Santa Claus doll and this uh, strange object that they just made, strange kind of uh, doll that they just made themselves that looked funny, looked like a robot. And the adult looks straight down the middle so that the gaze direction is not, um, is not, doesn't give a clue and says, oh, cool, okay, I recognize that, I know who that is. And the child assumes they're talking about Santa Claus. And that's mm. because everybody knows who Santa Claus is. So after about age three, they, they generalize the subjective common ground in the sense of objective meaning that everybody knows about that, and therefore it's in all of our common ground. Um, and before that, age two, age one, it's sort of personal common ground. They have to watch you learning about something before they know that we both know about it. So this objectified uh, common ground um, really kicks in in three or four years of age. Um, and it's the same age they objectify lots of other things um, uh, at the same time. So um, the notion of, uh, you probably heard about the famous false belief um, task where um, the, the uh, children, when, um, when the child is watching as an adult uh, sees an object uh, hidden under one box, and then the adult leaves the room and the toy is moved to a different box. And then the adult comes back and they say, where is he going to look for it? And young children think he's going to look for it where it really is. And the, the younger children think he, uh, sorry, the young children think he's going to look at it where it really is, but the older children say, oh no, he's going to look at it where he saw it last, because they have distinguished between what the person believes to be the case and what really is the case. And so beliefs, um, uh, the notion of a belief is that there are different subjective perspectives on things uh, and different um, judgments about what's true and what's the case, uh, I think that uh, the, the object is in this box, but then there's where, the, where it really is, and where it really is is independent of where you think it is and where I think it is and where anybody thinks it is. It's, that's the whole definition of objectivity is that it's independent of any person's um, perspective or belief. It, that's, and that's, again, a quick story. And uh, you also actually make a great point in your book, and you mentioned this other study, uh, where you mentioned that actually children after age three can understand uh, when they're being taught that the objective of instruction is to generalize knowledge, right? Great, yes, uh-huh. So... No, so that's... Uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, that actually, um, I borrowed that, uh, we've done a little bit on it, but I borrowed some of that from this, the Hungarian psychologists, um, George Gergé and Gergo Chibra, um, who talk about the pedagogical stance where when, when you say to the child, um, uh, you say it often in generic language. I, I, I'm thinking of like hunter-gatherer children. I always think evolutionarily. You mm -hmm. pick up a nut and you say, these are poison. And you mean these kind of nuts are poison. And that's, so I'm not telling you this nut right here is poison. I'm telling you I want you to generalize this to nuts of this type. And um, a lot of pedagogy has that generic kind of um, interpretation. It's often, um, it's often marked by so-called generic language. So I don't say this tiger is roaring. I say tigers roar. I don't say this bird is flying. I say birds fly. And so often, quite often when we're teaching kids, uh, we want them to generalize it. We want them to see it as generic, generalized um, cultural knowledge and they are predisposed to do so. So when they um, hear that, they automatically generalize to new things. And that's been shown in experiments done by the Hungarians and done by us. 
where if you say something in that, if you teach them something while looking at them and showing you that showing them that you're teaching them, then they automatically generalize it quite widely. That is, that is fascinating. And do you think that is because uh, they are able to understand that the perspective of the adult is to instruct? I do. And, and, and what, what, what the, what, when the adult's perspective is to instruct, I, I don't think children think this sort of consciously, but I think the, the general idea is they're not giving me their personal opinion, okay? They're not telling me their personal opinion that this nut is poisonous. They're telling me, they're speaking as a representative of the culture who has acquired all this cultural knowledge, um, uh, and they're speaking with the authoritative voice of the wisdom of the group, nuts like these are poisonous. And so, you know, even in, in a classroom, a modern classroom, the instructor is not saying it's my personal opinion that one plus one is two. I'm telling you, this is the way it is, all right? And, and yeah. the way it is is the way that we in our culture have... Um, come to uh, um, uh, instruct our knowledge, and, we're, and I'm trying to share with you our generalized knowledge, and I'm not giving you my personal opinion. So I think they somehow see it as coming from the culture, even though it's actually coming out of the mouth of a single person, they see it as cultural knowledge. So I, I have a question in, within this. So when, when we're talking about young children, it seems like it's, it's pretty easy to s sort of say this is a, a, a tendency to generalize. But when, when we look at older children and learning specifically, one of the biggest struggles is getting people to transfer knowledge from one domain to another. Do you think this, uh -huh. this, this approach of looking at the, the evolutionary way of having joint shared attention, is, it maybe gives some answers to why there's a struggle to get um, transferability in, in older children or maybe the relevance of the cultural perspective not being conveyed appropriately? Yeah, that's a very, that's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, um, uh, let, me, let me tell you a... Um, there's a, there's a famous paper I cite in the book uh, uh, called The Double-Edged Sword of Pedagogy. <laughs> and the, the, the experiment is the following. Um, they give the child, um, these are like three and four-year-olds, I believe. Uh, they give the child a toy which you can play with in about four different ways. You know, you can do different things to it. And one group, they just give it to the child and see what he does with it. And the other one, an adult, says, oh, look and they do one of the four things on the toy. And then you see how they play with it. And the children who've been instructed by the adult tend to play with the one thing. They think, oh, this is what you do with this. You know, the adult just showed me what you do with it. And it's almost implicit that the other things are not what this object really does. Again, it's not the, um, the normative way of using uh, the object. And the children who had no instruction tend to play with it all four different ways. So the reason the paper is called the double-edged sword of pedagogy is because obviously pedagogy is crucial to human development, but at the same time, when adults show you the right way to do something, it tends to close off um, other ways of doing it. So maybe that's what's going on when you're talking about generalizing is the adult is teaching it in one context, uh, this is how it is, and somehow um, uh, uh, it narrows you to thinking of other possibilities because you're thinking the adult's telling you the right way to look at it. Right. Oh, that's very insightful. I think that that's a that's a really powerful point to think about the. the and I think it, I think it speaks to some of the some of the different philosophies of education with younger children. Now, I, older children, it's a little bit less so. But with younger children, you know, there's the debate about whether you let children discover things for themselves or you teach it to them. And, you know, my wife and I differ on that a little bit. I have an eight-year-old, and when she was growing up, when, when she was growing up, I would say, and, and, and she would be playing with something or picking up a new toy, I would say, no, stay out of the way, you know, <laughs> move, back. let her, let her, let her explore it. And my wife would say, no, she needs to know how to do it, I'm going to show her. So uh, I think you can, I think you can differ on that, uh, uh, on, on that dimension, and I, I think, you know, there's some things that you just, uh, nobody's going to explore letters and learn how to read on their own. You have to be taught how to read. But, um, uh, uh, but there are some things, like exploring the functions of objects, where, um, where maybe exploring on your own is better than uh, being taught. Piaget had a famous quote, um, 
I assume you all know Piaget from... Oh, sure, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's not as big as Vygotsky because he didn't really have a, a, a pedagogical or an educational theory. But he was very much on the letting the child explore side of the continuum. And he has a famous quote where he says, um, every time you teach a child something, you deprive them of the opportunity for, of learning it for themselves. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, uh, well, that's a little extreme. <laughs> Sure, sure. I think there's a there's a certainly a middle ground between the two. I wanted to jump back for a second because uh, we we were talking a few minutes ago about this um, this need for a, a a shared starting point or a joint attention towards something for a communication yeah. to happen. And I just kind of I, I wanted to highlight for our listeners and maybe get your thoughts on the idea that. Uh, maybe some of the the difficulties in communication with people across different uh, different divisions of race or class or political ideals might might be really helped by uh, intentionally starting with common ground as the beginning of any discussion. Is that a is that a valid way to apply this approach you're talking about? It, it absolutely is, and I think that. Um, uh, you know, when you talk about some of the divide between just, for example, people in, in this country and a lot of the political uh, talking past one another, um, you know, there are just a lot of things that because, you know, some people who live out in the middle of the country and, you know, they need their guns, they want their guns, uh, they go to church every Sunday and, uh, um, you know, there's just a lot of things that they, that, that it, that are not common ground with um, the coastal elites or the press or the, the whatever. And I absolutely think that uh, to have a reasonable discussion, you need to get some common ground uh, somehow, common ground knowledge and common ground values. On the, um, we, we didn't, we've, been take, we've been talking mainly about learning and cognition and stuff, but the same applies in moral discourse where um, uh, if you and I are going to have a discussion about whether this is a good thing to do or not, and we're talking it through, and I say, aha, but here's a consequence you didn't know about. It's going to, you know, kill some innocent children. And you say, so what? Well, you know, how can we, we can't have a further conversation after that, uh, because I'm assuming we share the value that children, uh, that we shouldn't kill any children, and you're saying you don't care. So I think you have to have a, some common ground values to have a meaningful moral discussion, just like you have to have common ground knowledge to have a meaningful discussion about a topic uh, cognitively. Now, so values are, are largely a, a cultural construction, right? We sort of value the things we're taught to value. The, we value the things that are, are most commonly shown to us or, or exposing us to these things uh, as we go. So, so it's hard. Most, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say mostly, but again, I, I have some Piagetian uh, uh, roots. Um, uh, but there are some values that already two- and three-year-old children have, even social values, um, that uh, it's not clear to me that they're taught. So, for example, we, we have studies where young children will, if somebody's having trouble opening the door or they drop something, young children help them. Presumably that reflects the value of uh, of the other person, you know, getting what they want and so forth. Uh, and they're so young, there's just no way that they're taught that. Or they'll share things fairly, and I know that children are taught to share fairly quite a bit, but um, even at a very young age, uh, they will often do that. So um, so I agree with you. Most of the values we're talking about and the examples I'm giving are cultural, but I think there are some values about respecting other people and helping other people and stuff which have uh, uh, a lot of sort of natural uh, roots in uh, young childhood. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, Mike, if, if, uh, if this, this perspective-taking approach is such a powerful sort of inherent part of what we do, uh, how, does that yeah. relate, how does that relate to people's intelligence in your mind? Uh, you know, you can take that on any dimension of intelligence you want to think about, but if, if this is such an integral part of our learning process, then it seems it must, must be related to intelligence as a construct. Do you see any, any, anything in that? Well, intelligence is not one of my favorite constructs, I have to say. Um, okay. Do you have a reframing how you think about that? Uh, intelligence implies, you know, this across-the-board um, and um, 
I just don't, I, I don't really think that. I mean, you, you must have read some of the Howard Gardner or some of the stuff on multiple intelligences and that kind of thing. Uh, sure. I, I think that's been, that's been largely de, uh, debunked as a, as a way of approaching learning, as far as yeah. I understand. Yeah. You uh, okay. I, I haven't on followed all that. Intelligence, right? Sorry? You also have an approach on cultural intelligence, right? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, so, I, I, again, I mean, I think the, the kind of thing that an IQ test measures, it's not going to capture my ability to take perspectives, I don't think. Um, right. Uh, it, it, it captures what I've learned and tries to predict how I'll do in school. But you've heard, you know, I guess there's cultural intelligence, and of course there's the term emotional intelligence. Right. Um, Maybe, maybe we can back up for a second and think of this more from an evolutionary perspective. Because I think you're absolutely yeah. right that things, that things that measure intelligence in our sort of current society don't seem to be super relevant to, say, a caveman or a hunter-gatherer. And I, and I think any, me, any measure of intelligence should have been pretty well able, able to measure intelligence for a caveman as for an SAT student. Well, if I could, if I could just say briefly, yeah. if, 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 if you don't know, uh, the IQ test was invented by um, Alfred Binet in France, and its function was to predict who should go to college and who should not. Who should go get their abitur and go to college, and who should go ahead and learn a trade um, and uh, you know and not go to college. And and that's largely what it is. It's school type intelligence. It's literacy, obviously. It's numeracy right. with numbers. Up. Is solving the kind of abstract, out of context problems that we learn at school, and that you and Diego and I are all good at, or we wouldn't be where we are. Right. Uh, but uh, so it's measuring a certain kind of intelligence, and it might predict school and other kinds of success in a highly literate culture. But you're saying let's go back and think about evolution. Um, uh, individuals who are living today, who live in hunter gatherer cultures, uh, don't need any of that, uh, right. and they right. know how to. They know how to track animals, and they know how to prepare food, and they know how to make uh, canoes and bows and arrows or whatever that you and I would be absolutely lost at. So they have, they are, in, you know, their intelligence is adapted to um, the uh, cultural uh, tasks that have to be performed. Right, right, and, and so, so any, go ahead. Do you know Barbara Rogoff? We're, oh, oh, sure, a little bit. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, she's just right down the road from you uh, in uh, Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, um, she um, uh, makes a difference between what she calls informal and formal education. And the normal uh, education in small-scale societies and hunter-gatherer groups, but also small-scale uh, farming groups and whatnot, is uh, informal education where the child toddles along behind the parent and learns how to do, gradually learns how to do adult tasks. So they learn how to make tortillas, they learn how to sew clothes, they learn how to farm this, they learn how to milk the cow. They learn how to do the tasks in the culture by participating with the adults gradually. As they get older, they can participate more and more independently. And that's what she calls independent, uh, that's what she calls informal education. What we have developed in the Western world, really just in the last couple hundred years, is formal education out of the context of anything meaningful for adults. You're in a classroom. There are no adults there except the one who's, uh, uh, you know, talking to you. Uh, there's nothing real going on in terms of the culture, and you're just being taught these abstract skills that you're supposed to, that you believe are going to help you in the culture later, uh, but they're out of the context of the actual uh, thing that they will be applied to uh, later. So um, that's, uh, that formal education is a very specialized to our, uh, our Western uh, industrialized uh, countries where everything is so dependent on literacy, um, and it's only one form of education. Right, and this is kind of why there's certain cultural capital that students bring where some students are just much more inclined or successful in school settings because they, yeah. they have had sort of the, the socialization and the cultural capital to be able to say that these are what they value or how they learn. So one, of my, one of my favorite, 
one of my favorite studies uh, is um, by Shirley Bryce Heath. I don't know if you've heard of that, but um, this is old now. This is 30 or 40 years old. But she was looking at young African-American children in the rural south. I think it was in Appalachia. And uh, these African-American kids would come into first grade. And back then, they probably didn't have any kindergarten or preschool or anything. So they're six-year-old kids. They walk into essentially a white school, right? And, and at that time, this was the time when integration was starting. And, um, and the teacher would hold up something and say something like, what color is this? And the little kid would look at them like they were crazy. And the adult would think, well, they must be stupid. They don't know what color it is. But it turns out they're not used to these so-called test questions where the adult knows the answer already, right? The adult can see the color of it. So the, so, the, so the little child is saying, why is she asking me the color of this thing that's right in front of us, and she must know the color of it? So these, it's not a real question. The adult's not asking for information they don't have. It's a test question where I'm testing your knowledge even though I already have it. So that is a, that is a cultural format that all of us, all of, all of us people that went to, you know, good American universities, we were getting that from childhood. Of parents uh, asking us test questions. How do you spell this? And, you know, uh, what's the tallest mountain in the world? Asking all these test questions. Uh, but it's a special way of uh, interacting, and it prepares you for the school, formal education, decontextualized environment. And if you haven't had that before you get to school, it takes you a while to adapt to it. Right, right. Yeah. Which I think that has great implications on how we design classrooms that are uh, first culturally inclusive, but also culturally com co-constructed, right? Where we allow different kids to build their own cultures in every classroom. Absolutely, yes. And and you know, if you look if you look historically, um, when human inventiveness uh, in, uh, really took off. Uh, and where we started all the technology and, you know, mathematics and all kind of stuff, it's when, uh, it's when culture started interacting with one another. The hubs of cultural interaction in the ancient world were places like Greece and, and, and Cairo and Egypt and places where it was, they were crossroads of people from different cultures coming through and trading and doing things. And so um, I, th I think that's because there were all these people with different perspectives all in the same city. And back in hunter-gatherer days, before there was civilization and cities and around farms and whatnot, back when everybody was a hunter-gatherer, each group was kind of separate from each other group and just learned to do what it did. But then when, when we started with, you know, living in cities with multicultural um, inhabitants, uh, uh, this, this mixing of perspectives uh, led to great uh, cultural progress, if you want to call it that. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that, that's a really powerful point because it, it points to the uh, the nature of cultural change versus individual change. I mean, we, we yeah. I think I think we generally look at uh, you know improving outcomes as an individual basis where we want a single person to do better and we want to give them the tools or the mindset or the the resources to be able to improve. But I think what you just laid out is is sort of the uh, the cultural analogy to that where we're looking at how to increase our cultural awareness or our ability to take a new perspective or even innovate. Does that seem like that fits what you just said? Absolutely. I think it works on both the individual level and on the, uh, uh, on the cultural level. And that, you know, um, you know why? I, I was in Germany for a long time at the Max Planck Institute. I'm, I'm now at Duke University because it was a, a mandatory retirement thing. But, um, uh, in Germany, they think it's really important for the students to take a year abroad somewhere, like a gap year or something like that, to go experience another culture, uh, you know, firsthand, where you're really immersed in it and you really uh, can really learn some different perspectives. And uh, um, yeah, I think that I think that's really important. If we were to put this in the framework of your book, is that the is that expanding the the repertoire of, of how to apply joint attention? Is that kind of what they're trying to do? Is live uh, yeah. among others so you can take other lenses more easily? Uh, yes, I mean that's not in the book directly because so I don't apply it like that. But I right. think that's a reasonable application that uh, that uh, the more perspectives you get, the better. I mean, um, you know, what do we do? Uh, I mean. Uh, you know, I write papers and I write books and stuff, and so what do I do? I give them to my colleagues and say, 
give me some feedback. Why do I want feedback? Because they have a different perspective. And they and they see it from a different set of eyes than I see it from. And uh, when I get the feedback from people, it always is enriching. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. Um. Michael, that, that has a lot of implications for us, and I think that uh, we need to do a lot of thinking around how to apply those findings to our current pedagogical strategies. And um, I just want to take one minute to um, ask you another question, because uh, of course your book is about children that develop from ages zero to six, and how they develop a unique psychology during this stage. Uh, but there are so many examples we talk about uh, regarding adults, including ourselves, uh, and uh, I'm curious, since you also mentioned in your book how human adults differ in unique aspects to adult apes, for example, in their motivation towards teaching and instruction. Um, do you think humans, compared to other species, not only develop uniquely, but also age uniquely? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, there's not a lot of research on aging in apes, to be honest. So... Um, uh, we don't know so much how they age, but it, it, humans are uh, unique in how old we get. So apes are very similar to us in terms of what age they get teeth and they wean and they are sexually mature, but then they die. At, even, even in captivity with, with, with good food and good medical care, they still don't live past about 55 or so. So, uh, so the oldest humans are about double what the oldest apes are. So um, uh, I don't. So I don't know about the qualitative aspects of aging, but um, quantitatively, our lives are really extended, and um, there are various hypotheses about why that is. But um, uh, a lot of them have to do with uh, the cultural group that it's a benefit to the group uh, that you have individuals who've been around a long time and know where the watering hole is when a drought comes, or knows about the enemies over the mountains over there who haven't attacked in a long time or something. Yeah. Uh, so maybe they carry, carry some wisdom that is beneficial to the cultural group as a whole. When, when we put, I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of the hunter-gatherer approach, right? If we kind of step back yeah. and think about elderly people's role in the hunter-gatherer tribes, they were largely, you know, they weren't out hunting or even really probably gathering all that much, but they were staying close and caring for children and sort of yeah. being closer to the nest, so to speak. Um, yeah. do, you, do you think that that role for, for elderly people in our society has been lost with this longevity that we're, we're gaining and the sort of, there's almost like there's a cultural stigma around age now? I mean, have we, well, lost, have we lost a place for people in our society that have, uh, are getting on in years? I, they have to some degree. I mean, one of the things that I notice most about uh, being in Germany, and I mean, Germany is a Western industrialized culture just like America, but Americans are so mobile that uh, most, many, many people have their kids uh, away from their parents. And in Germany, uh, um, it happens more that people have their kids living in the same town that their parents live in, or in some cases, the parents, when they retire, move to where the kids are and the grandkids are. So they get a lot more exposure to grandparents. Uh, and in America, I think that's one thing we've lost, and I'm saying specifically America because we're so mobile, um, that um, uh, if, 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 if I, I don't know if either of you guys have uh, kids, but when you have a kid, it is hard work. And, it, and, and if you have a grandparent around, you can keep your job and, and keep your sanity uh, much better. And uh, so I think um, having old people uh, as grandparents is critically important, and we have lost a little bit of that. And in other, in other domains in the society, um, uh, I think there are probably some cases like in schools and things where old, older people could come and talk to the kids in school more than they do, and, and that would be helpful. So, yeah, I think, I think uh, grandparents to kids is a link that um, – is especially weak in America compared to other places, and uh, I think it's a shame. And yeah. you know, like thinking of so uh, one of prof uh, uh, one of the professors at Stanford uh, Psych Department, Laura Carstensen. Um, I don't know if you have heard about her theory of social social emotional selectivity. So basically, she has proved that when you grow older, your positive emotions become more salient. 
Um, uh -huh. And that's why uh, when you grow older, you're more likely uh, to commit time to meaningful work. For example, if you're a young parent and you want to take, let's take, for example, the hunters. So if you're a young hunter yeah. and you see a child, you're like, oh, that's my child, right? But if you're a grandma, you see two children, you're like, oh, look at these children. I'm not going to take care of that. Uh, so I'm just curious how, like, throughout the book, I was seeing that it actually would make sense that these emotional um, development throughout the lifespan actually helps evolutionary to keep maintain the cultural aspects of learning, but also to solve a scarcity of resources. Um, and yeah, I think it's very interesting to uh, dig into whether there's any difference between apes as they age and humans. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, there's not much research on the apes. What, what, what you get is um, they gradually uh, become less competent, obviously. And so if there's like a, a dominant male who's kind of the group leader, as he loses it, as he becomes uh, too old, uh, some young guy will come take over. And then he still, uh, you know, contributes, but just not as the group leader anymore. So, um, uh, but um, uh, I, we just don't know a lot about aging and age. Yeah, well, there, I guess there's not much money in studying dying apes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so we're, we're, we're getting close. we got like five to seven minutes left. Um, if there were some main things that you hope will sort of be changed or, or augmented in the way we think about or research them uh, based on what you wrote about in this book, what would you hope maybe the top three things would be, would start taking a, sec a new look at would be? Cooperation, collaboration, and, you know, given that, that, that you guys are educators uh, in the classroom, and I know it's not novel that uh, collaborative learning and peer learning and all that is a big movement in some places, uh, but it's not in other places. And I think that um, uh, kids learning in groups of peers is a, where they have to take different perspectives again. Um, again, Piaget was very big on the fact that... Um, uh, when you have a discussion with an adult about something, the, the, the young child, the five or six or seven year old child, they just assume the adult knows the right answer and they just kind of defer to them. So they don't sort of actively, you know, discuss or argue to the same degree because they just know the adult's got the right answer ahead of time. But when you interact with a peer, you know that they're not any smarter than you are. They don't know any more than you do. And so you're really on your own trying to win the discussion or make your point or uh, whatever. So when you, when you do this peer learning, I think you learn how to do some reasoning and, um, uh, and you know, justifying your arguments and uh, giving evidence and stuff that, you, that you, is just not really activated when you're interacting with adults. So both are important, you know, I'm an adult, I'm not dumping on adults, but uh, uh, adults are experts about stuff and they can tell you important stuff and they can teach you how to read and teach you how to do math, but this other dimension of learning how to, um, um, you know, engage with others rationally and make arguments and stuff are really, um, uh, you need peers for that. And a lot of classrooms just don't leave a lot of time for that. And, and even if they do have little tables of kids who might do the stuff together, the adult is intervening so much that um, and structuring it so heavily that they still don't get a lot of that. So, um, so I guess that would be one thing from an educational point of view. And um, uh, one thing that seems to be really motivating for kids that I think can uh, work there is if you have teams that are kind of competing with one another. So then you're both cooperating uh, and at the same time competing. And that really is, in the modern world, uh, as in the United States, that really describes the way we do things a lot. So we scientists always work in teams. Everything I do is in teams. But I'm hoping our team does better than the other teams and we get the presentation <laughs> first or something. So, and, and, if you're, and if you're working in a, you know, some kind of business or something, you're working as a team with your business uh, colleagues and you're hoping that your company does better than the next company. 
So I think I think working collaboratively is good in general, and working as teams with sort of team competition is a, is another variation on that theme, which uh, which fits well with uh, my general approach to um, uh, to the importance of collaboration and peer interaction in education. Great, great. Um, well, we're just about out of time at this point. I had a quote from your book that I just wanted to kind of throw out there and give you a chance to comment on before we say goodbye, if that's okay. Okay. Okay, the quote is, stating a fact is actually expressing a belief or a set of value. And to me, this was just yeah. a, a powerful comment. Uh. Okay, say that again. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, paraphrasing the beginning, you, but you said you. stating a fact is actually expressing a belief or a set of values. And I think this yeah, is a very yeah. like philosophical statement about the subjectivity of even the things we take as objective truths. Yes, I, I, yes. Um, I, I, again, that is something that I uh, you want my comment on that. My comment is that um, science. Is science is our best way of finding out how things work objectively. But the way it works is you've got a lot of different subjective perspectives and they interact with one another and clash with one another and then we try to come up with the best view of things that's objective in the sense that it's independent of any one perspective. So I think that that's the process and um, yeah, we can start that early and it continues into um, adulthood. Very, very cool. And that, that, uh, that consensus is really at some level just a cultural consensus, even if we call it an objective truth. Is this the same objectification of ideas, sort of just taking them outside of ourselves, and that's, that's how we call yeah. it an objective yeah. truth? It almost means uh, another, another definition of objective is that um, it doesn't depend on any given perspective. It's outside of any given perspective. So absolutely, that's what we're aiming at in science and what we're aiming at in lots of other, other activities in the in our real lives. All right. Well, we're, we're out of time here, Michael. So thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. This has been a really fun conversation. Diego, thanks for sitting in and co-hosting with me today. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Michael. We learned so much throughout this hour. So right. I, well, I'm, I hope... Go ahead. I'm glad, I'm glad you have electricity. No, oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think they let the Stanford Hospital off the hook for that one. Uh, so again, I've been just sitting down with a co guest co-host, Diego Sierra, and our guest, Michael Tomasello, talking about his new book, uh, Becoming Human, A Theory of Ontogeny. So uh, I got it that time. Great. <laughs> so uh, thanks again. And uh, this right. is Ben Woodford with Modern Education signing off. All right, bye.